my talk this evening, Nothing Venture, Nothing Gain, is not a life story. It's the lessons learned in 30 years of travel and exploits. And it starts with, even the best made plans can go wrong. When I started traveling, four of us, two boys, two girls, got together, and we planned to spend a year <laughs> traveling overland through Africa. We bought a Land Rover. We made all the preparations, all the provisions you can imagine you may want, and we set off. We got through Europe and the Sahara Desert. Then the two boys stole the Land Rover and vanished. That left me and the other girl, Leslie. All our hopes and dreams crashing down, everything we'd planned. But we hadn't gone all that way to give up. The trouble was we were abandoned in Nigeria, which at that point ran out of fuel, so there was nothing on the roads. What would you do? We acquired two semi-wild horses, and we put our sleeping bags on their backs as saddles and made bridles out of string, and set off riding across West Africa. It was hard, because it was semi-desert, uh, and we learned, we started learning to survive. And we learned how much stamina we had, and that the more we looked, the more we dug, the more stamina we found in ourselves that we didn't find until we had to find it. Luckily, there was a bit of a rainy season that left puddles that the horses drank, and so did we. When we reached Cameroon, the land ahead was jungle. Jungle's no good for horses, so we sold the horses and we went on hitchhiking into the center of Africa, where we were stopped again by an even bigger rainy season, turned all the roads to mud, no way through. Lateral thinking. According to our map, there was an enormous river, the Ubangi, going down into the Congo River, down to Brazzaville. We'd go that way. So we bought a dugout canoe and two paddles and set off down the river. Straight away, we realized it was too strong to turn back. We were committed. The first night, we made a lot of mistakes. There was nowhere to camp. The jungle had no clearings. Uh, so we parked beside a cliff of sand. And at dusk, we set up our mosquito nets in the canoe and settled down to sleep. The mosquitoes were ferocious. But eventually, we fell asleep. And then until the rain started, pouring rain in the middle of the night, I woke. Leslie woke as well, but she jumped up, she staggered, she tripped, she fell over board and vanished into the river. And the cliff of sand we were parked beside got undermined by all this rain, and it fell forward onto the canoe, which started to sink. Um, could anything else go wrong? But no. <laughs> I found Leslie, dragged her back on board, and we spent till dawn bailing out the sand and water. From then on, we learned to sleep on the sandbanks mid-river, no mosquitoes. And the trip was nearly three months long. We learned a lot. We had wanted to stick to the river banks because we thought we'd be closer to the land if we capsized, because uh, we didn't know how to paddle, but we learned. And we also realized that closer you are to the bank, that's where the fallen trees are half submerged in the rocks. That's where the dangers are. And we looked out mid-river where the current was racing along and we went out to join it. There was one point where the river made a sharp air bend between cliffs. We could hear the water roaring ahead of us, but we paddled faster because the only way to control a canoe is speed. Faster, we had to go faster. Uh, whirlpools broke out both sides of us, ahead of us. We just kept paddling. We were by this time shrieking with excitement, and by the time we came out of that very long air bend, we were yelling with excitement and exhilaration. When we reached Brazzaville, the end of our journey, we tied the canoe up at the wharf and went to immigration office to get our passport stamped. They said that people had never arrived um, from the center of Africa by canoe before, therefore we were spies. And they arrested us, they locked Leslie up, but before they could lock me, I realized I had to keep some control of the situation and not show fear. If you show fear, you give people power over you. So I went for the control side and said, no, I can prove that uh, we came from the center of Africa. Our canoe is unlike anything you've ever seen here. Let me show it to you. Let me prove that our story is true. And I marched, and they came with me. We went to the dock. I showed them the canoe. Thank God they believed me. 
uh, they set us free. They even put us on television. Um, that was a bit of a shock. From there, free again, we went back into the jungle. Six months later, we reached Rhodesia, no, Zimbabwe, uh, where Leslie left me to get married. Lovely girl, we're still in touch, but when she left, I had a quandary. Two people is wonderful to travel because you share the workload and you look after each other. Would, did I have the courage to travel alone? Even with a horse, perhaps. If I could, the whole world would be open to me. Could I do it alone? I went, I thought I'd try. I went south and bought a horse in a horse sale uh, and rode for 4,000 miles around southern Africa. I love horse travel. That actually led me into long horse journeys, usually only a thousand miles a time, uh, through some of the wildest parts of the world. What I love about horses is that they give you such freedom. They carry you, they carry your luggage, they swim the rivers, you cross the mountains, or hoof drive. At night, I'd camp in the wilds. Um, I didn't have a tent. I had a hammock. Uh, which I'd sling between trees, and it kept me away from the insects and the damp of the ground. Often I stayed in villages, and uh, in the villages, it's, people, it's important that you give people some way of relating to you, some way of interacting. I had photos, photos of mother, father, home, so they could see, I'm not a foreign devil, I'm just a person like anyone. And I took photos as well of snow, amazing, uh, and ordinary things like vegetables and field farm animals in our country, because that's the kind of thing you can build a conversation without a language. The other thing I learned was always to smile, step forward, and introduce myself. And uh, often people would ask me to speak at public event, you know, the installation of a new chief, or whatever reason, they would ask me to speak. And I realized, you know, you see a funny face in all the crowd. You, people just want to hear the sound of your voice. Uh, it didn't matter that they couldn't understand. So I got used to being able to say, you know, thank you for your welcome, and to thank them all for their kindnesses to me, uh, because all they wanted was to know what I sounded like. After 20 years, one other point, being a woman, um, it wasn't more difficult being a woman. I was, if anything, more of a novelty and less of a threat. In Papua New Guinea, I was initiated into manhood. Um, this was because I was yet again traveling by river in a dugout canoe, and I'd set out to paddle down New Guinea's longest river, the Sipi. It would take me three months. And uh, in one village, they decided to initiate me into manhood because I was doing what no woman could do, according to them. It was a painful and frightening ceremony. It's meant to be painful and frightening uh, because you, you, you go through pain and fear and come out on top of it. Then for the rest of your life, you're that bit stronger. After 20 years, I reached Madagascar. Madagascar is different. It, it actually it spread, split off Africa in dinosaur times, and everything there evolved in isolation. Um, its flora and fauna is extraordinary. The poverty there was equally mind-blowing. Um, it, it's hard to imagine from our background, but it made me really think again. I met the head of UNICEF, and he challenged me, find a project to help fight poverty in Madagascar. So I started looking. I formed a charity, the Doddwell Trust, uh, British registered, and looked for a project. I felt inadequate on a lot of ways, because what do I know? I know about writing books, radio, um, and making films, and obstacles. I know about obstacles in travel. Then I found a radio drama series, which is using uh, scandal, intrigue, and suspense to carry um, information, to bring awareness to the population about mother and child. You know, why 
perhaps clinics were useful, why children should be vaccinated, all the very first step stuff that Madagascar needed so that any age agencies that were there could be more effective. They needed those first steps, uh, nutrition, hygiene, uh, AIDS awareness, family planning, all these things could be threaded into our story. I got a studio, I equipped a full studio at National Radio and set up a network of 50 rural radio stations in addition to our uh, national broadcast. Uh, I received funding from UNI USAID, UNICEF and UNFPA, uh, hired producer for technicians, actors, um, the lot and production started, but there was something missing. I wanted radio to be two-way. I don't just want to broadcast, I want to listen as well. And I said, how about these you know, radio groups? And they said, no, it can't work, it never has worked. That's where I said, well, I can't know that, I haven't tried. The wind-up radio had just been invented, uh, so I ordered the first lot off the production line. They arrived and we trained, like the opinion leaders in the villages, how to discuss what they'd heard in the programs, tell us what they understood, didn't understand, liked, didn't like, which gave us a wonderful opportunity always to improve so that we could use the feedback to continually make it more relevant and make it more useful to their lives. Um, so that we ran for five years. Yes, out of a country of 13 million, we ended up with 10 million faithful listeners. And if ever one of our programs was late to arrive at a rural station, the people, crowds of people, would pick at the station. We want to know what happens next. Um, so that we met all our objectives. And it was wonderful to be able that the objectives were to make what other people did more effective. Sometimes I wonder what training I've had for this. But then I think of the challenges I've been through and I've skipped through 30 years this evening. Um, but when I think, yes, I've been arrested, in fact, probably 10 times now. I have a chapter that I call Tested Exits from Tight Corners. Uh, what to do when, um, you know, when the prison door comes open. My one thing is just don't let it lock behind me. Whether I uh, play sick, whether I play nuisance. Uh, I have a whole raft of different fallbacks on how to deal with being under arrest. Um, it's never easy, but don't let me give anyone the idea that travel is only glamorous or easy or wonderful. It also has its difficult moments. Really, this evening, what I want to say is don't be a passenger in life. Take part in it. If you've got something helpful to say, stay it, say it. Smile, step forward. You only live once. Thank you.